Joining us now from Palm Beach, Florida, the Emmy award-winning talk host, producer, and author of the latest book, his latest book, Spike the Wonder Dog, as told, there he is, as told to Bill Boggs. And let me tell you, this dog has got a lot of stories to tell. Uh, thank you for taking some time out. Thank you for joining us, Bill. Uh, let me begin by saying you're down in South Florida. I'm here in Southern California. We're both in hot spots. How's it going down there right now? Well, as, you know, according to the news, uh, it's terrible down here right now. Uh, the, the highest percentage of infections of the, of the virus are with people under 25 at the present time. So you have different, you know, the state of Florida is a long state. We're in Palm Beach County, very high rates here, but on the actual island of Palm Beach, Palm Beach is a barrier island. Mm -hmm. It does not have hundreds of thousands of people on it. You know, it's not like Long Beach Island or anything like that. Um, then there's West Palm Beach, which, which is built up. We feel safe here. Uh, we're in uh, a two bedroom, two bathroom condo right on the beach. Uh, I could take the camera down and, you know, say, I'll show you what right out there. Absolutely. Outside we've got, the, there's a forest right over there. And then around that way is, is the ocean over there. So it's healthy living and the pool is open. I can go swimming five days a week. That's I a can good go thing. seven, but I choose to go five. And um, life is good. Uh, you know, we're blessed. All we have to do is adjust. It's not like when I see the people working in the, I had to go to an event the other day with, I had a face mask on for like an hour. Ay, ay, ay. Wasn't pleasant. So we're doing okay. We're, we're lucky. We're among the lucky people. But life has changed. I mean, for all of us, it's really changed dramatically. I mean, do you feel that or like, we'll be back to normal? I, I don't know when we'll be back to whatever is. The oh, uh, well, the only thing, I'll give you one sentence on it. And I think two years from now, you can quote me. And I'm not usually correct about a lot, but I think I'll be correct about this. Uh, there is no return to normal. Everything is a new normal that there is will be a new i don't i don't see anything being like it was i think the entertainment business is changed changing i think work the workplace the way people work will be changing the way people travel will be changing it is it is changing will I, let, me, it, let me put in the will have changed will can have you changed. imagine if you were hosting the talk show now in new york you'd be doing this you wouldn't be at the studio uh, probably not. I mean, at Channel 5 now, where I worked mm -hmm. 13 years, some people go in every day. They, they, uh, I was on the morning show there. And they split it up, but everybody doesn't go in every day. That's, it's, it's, all, it's all changed. Now, I must say, as, as we begin, um, um, you hosted for years uh, the show Midday Live on W, was WNEW, then WNYW TV, which was my first, before you were there, my first job. I was a page on that show. Um, I mean, we're going back. Uh, who was the host? Lee Leonard. Oh, wow. That's the man who retired, and then I replaced him. He replaced him, and he went on to see it. He, he didn't retire from the business. He just left the job. So he, he just left the job, and he went on to CNN. So your, your place of business, your 205 East 67th Street, is a, is a first job for, for me. And uh, true to being... Bill Boggs, the reputation. You had great years in New York City. How did you, but let's, let's go back before that. High Point, North Carolina, because that dovetails into the book too. <clears throat> what happened there? Well, um, yeah, you mentioned my book starts in High Point, North Carolina, where I, where I went from Philadelphia. I'm from Philadelphia. I'm right. on a TV show in Philadelphia as the associate producer called McLean and Company. I was on once a week. I would come on as uh, Mr. Weekend and tell people where to go in Philadelphia over the weekend. And then I produced the show, help of an associate producer. Debbie Miller was a producer. We had, we had very successful. Nancy Myers, the oh, esteemed, the writer director was my intern. So oh, my. we had a good group there. Uh, yeah, I've had other interns over the years who've been, I have a whole bunch of dumb intern stories. And I have <laughs> stories. Anyway, uh, after a couple of years of that, I made a New Year's resolution going into 1970 and the new decade. You know, excuse me, going to 1972. 
that I would go anywhere in America to get my own show so I could be working every day doing what I wanted to do. So I sent it out to everybody I knew when I ended up getting an audition in High Point, North Carolina on a, w, a WGHP TV, an ABC affiliate. And they liked what they saw, I, obviously they hired me. And then I created a show called Southern Exposure with Bill Boggs, on which I had a dog, my own pet, who was named Spike, who appeared on that show and became Spike the Wonder Dog. So it's a dual answer to your question. What happened in North Carolina was I had one of the greatest successes of my life, uh, a show called Southern Exposure with Bill Boggs. I had the dog on that, which has led to a current novel. The show got syndicated in the South. And it was so much, this last interview I did, somebody said, what, what was it like there? Never in my life did I experience anything remotely close to the fame and recognition that I had in High Point. It was like, you know, say Robert Redford walking down the street in New York in 1975, everybody would see him. Everywhere I went, everybody knew the who I was. And I became, I recognized that as a, an element of fame, that is not a particularly uh, comfortable thing. If you're in a restaurant and you realize, you know, people are looking at you, looking at you, you know, I became somewhat self-conscious in High Point. And when I got to New York and I did, was there and people knew who I was, it never was as intense as, as New York City. And I once explained this to one of those uh, New York people who just happens to think that New York is the center of the universe. And I, they asked me about it. And I said, they said, yeah, but it was only North Carolina. And I said, yeah, but it was still my life. Yeah. Anyway, so that show was really successful. And then I went from there up to New York, Manhattan, just as the characters in the book follow the arc of my career. This is not, if anything, there are elements of a comedic memoir in The Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog, because if the first half of it follows my career, the dog becomes a TV star, his host is a television master, like the TV talk show host like me is his master. And a lot of what no one has yet to interview me, and I've done 47 interviews about the book, about some of the things in the book that actually did occur on talk shows, that the day will come when this will happen. But anyway, so High Point was metaphorically also a high point for my life. I had complete control over my show. The show beat the Today Show for three years, doubled the ratings of the Today Show. And I could do whatever I wanted. So, you know, I went from there to a more uh, disciplined environment where people were, quote, producing me. Mm -hmm. I had to like, argue to get ideas on the show. So there, there was an element of um, discomfort for me the entire 13 years I did the show because I didn't have the control I had had for three years in North Carolina. Well, go back to Spike. Now, you're up in New York. You're in there at Studio 3 there, whatever it was on the first floor, right? And you're doing the show. And the third floor, yeah. and you're and you're you you Spike is with you now, right? You've got the dog. No, no. Spike the, is the dog. Spike the, the, the Spike the Wonder Dog, who got more fan mail than I did in North Carolina in Southern Exposure, <laughs> did three to one. He got, he got killed before I came to New York. Run over right in front of me by a drunk driver. A horrible, horrible situation. So the idea, so we never came to New York, obviously, I didn't transport a dead dog, you know, keep him with me in the apartment, Norman Bates or something like that. And so I thought when I was going to write this, start writing the book, the idea, and I don't remember where I got the idea, what if Spike hadn't gotten killed and had come to New York with me in today's world? I originally started writing the book set in the mid 70s and it wasn't nearly as interesting. I abandoned that within, 30 minutes, because there's so much more going on today to satirize than what was going on back then. But what would have happened if the dog had come with me in today's world and became a big TV and social media star? So that's like the, the germany. What happens? So, so in your head, what, what did Spike begin to do as you hosted this show? Uh, what do you mean? In, well, it, 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 in, this, in this world, because it, it, you said it wasn't in the 70s or the 80s, in today's world, how did you envision Spike? Well, that's what I wrote in the book. I mean, he becomes a star. He has a, a segment of the show called Spike at Noon, 
I had a segment on midday called Bonds at Noon, and stuff happens out there. And uh, he, he goes, he makes public appearances. The, the, opening, the opening line of, of the book, the, the, oh, it's, the, the story is narrated by the dog. So it's like the Call of the Wild, or, uh, which was narrated by the dog, or <laughs> an Art of Racing in the Rain, which was narrated by the dog. This book is a comedic book. Winston Groom, who reviewed the book, by the way, the book does not come with this paper in it. You have to be the author to have that paper in it there. Um, so here is Spike, this is Spike's voice, the prelude says, right, last week, I'm getting a standing ovation from fans at the garden for returning Roger Federer's 135 mile an hour serve with my head. And now I'm locked in a cage on a filthy concrete floor growling at two guys named Julio. That's the first sentence of the book. So he was at the garden making a, an appearance and something happened to him. What was the biggest challenge in modern day, today's day, putting this book, writing this book for you? What, what came up? The biggest challenge is blocking out the time and just doing it. That was the biggest challenge. Creatively, yeah. I had it within my power to do it because I did it. I mean, in other words, if you said, Bill, you're going to become a jet pilot. I don't have it within my power to do that. I would fail the course. I would not know how to do it. So I had it within my power to write this book. It's my second novel. The first one, which was published several years ago, was actually optioned for a movie, but the movie never got made. I know how to write. I began as a comedy writer. I've been writing since I was seven years old creatively. So I had it within my power to write it. Doesn't mean it was easy. It doesn't mean that there weren't problems to solve all along the way, but it was a completely enjoyable process. I, I kept saying to myself and my beloved Jane, no matter what happens with this book, I am really enjoying the process of writing it. And that it always flows. It just flows from you. Hmm? It it's, just flows. Well, it, there were days when it really flowed and then you, uh, you were uh, just there in the moment. And then there were days when it didn't. But the most difficult part was blocking out the time for doing it. And then once I was started, once the voice of the dog came through me, as I'm typing away, I knew that I had something because as a fiction writer, you write in the voices of different characters. So my character was narrating the book and he was speaking through me in a voice I have never used on stage. I have six different stage shows I do or a voice I had never written in. And I, as I said, I do a lot of writing, so I had a unique thing and it kept driving me. You know? I felt while I was doing it, that I was really creating something good, but you never know, you know, you never know until you're finished. So what I did with the book, The Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog, when I had the first draft, I went to eight people whom I know as friends, uh -huh made them an offer, which they could refuse. One of them said, I, I can't do it, I don't have time. I said, please read this. You have two months, but within the next two months, I want you to have read every word of the book. I will take you to dinner at a restaurant of your choice. We'll have a nice time. And at the dinner, you'll give me your unvarnished opinion of what you think. I don't, I'm not doing this for you to blow smoke here, Mal. I want you to tell me what you think. And that is like a comedian testing his material, Ross Crystal. You know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. So yeah. all eight people said, laugh out loud funny. Most I've laughed reading a book in years. And I said, I, then that confirmed what I was doing in the creative process, Ross. And then what I did after that, went back and went through from the first page all the way through it, punched it up, kept putting more and more relevant stuff in it. The last words that went into the book, the night before the book had to be published and it had been proofread five times, everything like that. It was March and I inserted in front of made, there's a sentence in there, made in stale, mm -hmm. made in gingerbread houses. And I took out stale and I wrote <laughs> virus free. <laughs> the last two words that went in the book. Up until midnight tonight. If somebody starting out or trying to be a, a writer, creative writer, said, Do you give me some advice? What do I need to know? What right. I need to write. You know, it, like a painter, you have to have an easel. Tennis player, you got to have a court, somebody to play with. If you're a writer, 
And that's why I chose after the last TV show, I went off, Jesus, you know, I've been cha- I've had 15 different shows. I've done all this stuff. I've been chasing jobs all my life. I'm in my mid seventies. I am just going to now write. I can control this, whether it's successful or not, but I'll have a creative outlet. I'll be using my mind. And so anybody who wants to has to read a lot and write. And just say, every day I'm gonna write. And Jerry Seinfeld writes almost every day of his life. And there are people who say, you know, I had this great idea once for a book. They don't do it. I, I believe in, I truly believe in the word resolve. You, you have an idea, you believe in the idea, you must resolve to make it happen. Is the old adage, write what you know, a good one? Would you repeat that? The, the, the first couple of words were- The old clear. adage, the old adage, write what you know. You knew comedy, you knew talk, you knew, is that, is that a good rule of thumb? You know, I, like, I, I, that's one of the reviewers, the, the review out in East Hampton, Dan's papers, some, one of the reviewers said, you know, there's an, oh yeah, I remember the oh, Henry magazine. There's an old adage that says, write what you know, and that was exactly. the first, yeah, you're right. Back up, what, what brought you into talk? What, what were you, in Philadelphia, you're growing up and you said, I want to be on television? Is that what you did? I knew I wanted to, I, I knew I wanted to be in show business. I knew, I, I, I knew my strengths were in creativity. I, I wouldn't say that I look back on it as a, you know, a 12 year old, oh, my strengths are, but it was evident to me that I had the gift that I had been given. You know, we all, gift, but my gift was public speaking. As uh, back in elementary school, in good old Philadelphia, this distant elementary school, in fifth grade, all 32 kids in the class had to get up and talk for about five minutes about something. Now, I remember one of the, two of the, one of the girls in the class, Lois, last name, you know, wet her pants. And we were, we were already 10 or 12 years old. She was, so others were shaking and quivering. For whatever reason, I just got up and there it was. I started talking, having fun. Kids are listening to me. I went to my seat. Wow. And that gift, that's, a, that's the gift that I have. And I've exploited that. And I'm still doing <laughs> it right now at this very moment. Which is a good thing to do. You know, uh, when I, again, I kind of, I watched you. I was hosting a show down in Washington, which was kind of a sister show. And we looked at to, to, to Midday Live uh, when I was hosting Panorama and said, you know, they're, they're doing all kinds of interesting stuff up there. Every now and again, one of your producers had come down to, to Washington. And um, uh, when you left Midday, you went on to do another show that I really loved, um, uh, which was Corner Table over on the Food Network. That was many years later. Many but years I, later. But you knew your food. <laughs> you yeah, knew your food. I left Midday. I, I worked with Dick Clark for a while on a game show concept that never got sold. Then I needed to make money, so I went back to, to Philadelphia and <clears throat> hosted a show called Time Out on KYW. Right. I got an offer. They made me an offer. I couldn't refuse to be executive producer of the Morton Downey Jr. show. You mentioned Morton Downey. You were executive producer of a show that really was the trailblazer of many f- programs that are on the air now, and you were, were running it. What did you see, not only in Morton Downey Jr., but that style of television back then? Well, Morton Downey Jr. was somebody, they brought me in, the show was a local show on WWR Channel 9, and Bob Pittman and his team hired me away from the show I was doing in Philadelphia. They wanted somebody who could produce, and I had, together with my um, producing partner, Boggs Baker Productions, the brilliant Richard Baker, who is now the manager of Tim Allen, uh, had produced several shows for MTV at the dawn of MTV, and Bob Pittman, who created MTV. So somebody said, the, the guy who was running the Downey show apparently was not a back. And they wanted to have somebody who could understand talk shows and also be a producer. And somebody said, what about Bill Boggs? And having had produced with Richard Baker for Bob Pittman and the MTV days, good shows, they, they offered me double my existing salary from the talk show. The biggest money ever made from a, a fee, a salary, was the Morton Downey Jr. show. And that was a long time ago. So um, that, I did not discover Downey. I, I, walked, in, I walked into the job. I, I liked the show a lot. I thought the show was really, really original. And 
Look, there's a no, 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 oh, no, no, my no. lovely Jane just wanted to see Hello. what you. I want to see what you look like. Yeah. Handsome, very handsome. handsome see. <laughs> Hello, Jane. <laughs> I think that um, the Morton Downey Jr. Uh, show does it ushered in a level of uh, more abrasiveness on television that certainly certainly is in our culture now. I mean, I would not say that everything that's abrasive in our culture can, can be traced to Mort. But Mort was abrasive. Mort uh, got ratings because he was abrasive and in, in people's face. His demographic was like a heavy metal audience of, of more men than women, young. That's a huge, interesting demographic. That's why this, we got the spot, made so much money with the sponsors. Um, so. The line from Mort's behavior, you can, you can trace a line from Mort to Trump, uh, who they were friends, and Mort for a while had an apartment in Trump, in Trump Tower, mm -hmm. in that they very much performance artists. I think Trump certainly is a performance artist. Morton Downey Jr. is a brilliant performance artist. And Trump, I, uh, like Morton Downey Jr., would just say anything with a great deal of conviction. Mort, um, but Donald Trump is, a, is an extreme exponent of the, the power of positive thinking. If you read his bio or read any, there was an Atlantic Magazine article about that. He really is, it almost takes it as far as it can go. And Morton Downey Jr. had the ability to say things and then magically believe that they had happened. So he once did something and we knew he had done it. And he, well, he said, I'll take a lie detector test and deny it even though he knew he had done it and knew the lie detector test was to see if he had done it, he passed the lie detector test 100% perfectly. And so that there were some interesting parallels between them. And you hit the word that I was getting at, the show and Morton himself, in your face. It, it, all those programs that follow that are in your face, I always track back to, I mean, there were others, Joe Pine, those guys way, 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 way back when, but he and really- Burke, you know, Joe Pine and Alan Burke. Yeah. And then after Mort, Geraldo had a show that was like a copy of the Morton Downey Jr. show, and then Jerry Springer. But the difference between, the, the people say, oh, Morton Downey was like the antecedent of Jerry Springer show, but partially true. But the Jerry Springer show is a normal host with crazy guests. Morton Downey Jr. So was a crazy host, host. with guests. You know, we did Point. programs like, we were written up, the Morton Downey Jr. Show was written up in Time Magazine for its contribution to uh, African-American culture for the five shows we did at the Apollo Theater in Harlem on, on location. We, we did shows like Women in the Military, a lot of shows on abortion. We did some, uh, subjects that were somewhat salacious. They got great reviews, but we also did major serious subjects. Dershowitz was on a lot. We had a, uh, anyway. What, what fulfills you most? Being on camera as a host, running a host as an executive producer, or sitting down at that typewriter and, and computer and, and banging out a book? What is the first part of the question again? You get what which fulfills you most? Being a, a host, uh, on the air, running the host behind the scenes as an executive producer, or banging out that book slowly but surely? Well, after, when I took the executive producer job at Downey, I had been on television a lot of years, five, five days a week for 16 and 17 years. So I was glad to stop doing that and, and run an operation with really, if I, if I told you, well, I'll tell you. The staff of the Morton Downey Jr. show, Ed Glavin was one of the associate producers, now the executive producer of Evelyn DeGeneres' show, right. the executive producer of the Jenny, Jenny Jones Collins show, was the executive producer of um, Queen Latifah show. One of the most successful daytime, his right-hand man, Andy, Andy um, was also a Downey producer. Right. Then, you know, Regal, who ran all digital content for the Wall Street Journal. That's three highly successful people. Rebecca Johnson, who writes for Vanity Fair. These are all young people who were this, and none of them was a conservative. Like Downey was seen as a conservative guy. Everybody was quite liberal on the staff. 
And we just produced it like verbal wrestling. It was verbal wrestling. But back to which fulfills you most, being out front, being behind the scenes, or writing? Between now, at this stage of my life, see, when I did the Downey Show, it was more fulfilling than the last couple of years of being on television because I got bored being on television. It was, I was repeating myself. Then when I started writing the book, which is my third book, it was more fulfilling than the stuff I was doing for the last show of my generation. But of the three, I would take hosting because hosting includes writing and it includes producing. Producing includes writing, but doesn't include hosting. Writing includes just writing, but life experiences. I would take, I would take hosting and, and, and write a lot while doing it. And I can understand that. And, and, you know, every now and again, I'll be watching something, be it on PBS or Netflix or whatever, and uh, a, a documentary, and up you'll pop. Uh, latest, I was watching something on, on uh, Sammy Davis Jr. There he was with you. And I, I said, you know, th there's one guy on my show we did not get, just never happened. We never had Sammy Davis Jr. And I always admired him. And I said, Bill did a hell of a job. And that's just one person that you have to say, you know, times of our life and not only legendary, but what, 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 what were your feelings about him after you? Well, thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. That interview with Sammy Davis Jr. and 485 other clips and shows are on my YouTube channel, Bill Boggs TV. Um, most recently, and for my, I'm currently doing a show like you are. It's called Trap Live with Bill Boggs. And the last one, Costas, so he's there. We had Judy Gold. Is there. A lot, many, we've done seven, seven or eight shows, Lucy Arnaz. So just go to Bill Boggs TV on YouTube if you want to see what we're talking about. Right now. It, it's a lot of good stuff. Wrapping it back to the, and wrapping it up with the adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog, as told to Bill Boggs. You look at that as, a, there you go. You look at that as a possible animated series, perhaps? Oh, geez, that would be my ultimate goal, to have the book option for a cartoon, a streaming series, or a movie. I have to find, a writer with a, a screenwriter or scriptwriter who has industry credibility, who loves the book, who could adapt it, or a producer who would see the efficacy of the material, the, the, the wit, the humor, just because the book, it's a funny book. I mean, that's what it's designed. It's 285 pages of comedy writing. So yeah, and it's, by the way, available, it's Postal Press, anywhere you, you uh, can get a book or Kindle. Amazon, just type in Spike the Wonder Dog, Bill Boggs. And you'll and find it. Amazon, uh, orderspike.com. Yeah, uh, orderspike.com. Wherever. Um, final question. What's good about talk? What's not so good about talk in 2000, in, in 2020? That's a very good question. Thanks. What's good about talk is in the midst of this pandemic, there is, a, there is a profusion of long form. If you had asked me this question, absent the pandemic, I would have said, there's not enough real authentic communication on television, including even the great shows like Stephen Colbert. He's brilliant. He's as good as anybody who's ever done late night. Mm -hmm. There were times when he is a guest and they're really not having an authentic conversation. I mean, sometimes Carson would get into conversational moments but it was you know, pretty strict, structured with questions. But now, because of the pandemic, you're talking to me for a half an hour. Other people, um, I have a show called Trap Live. Mm -hmm. it, 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 and it's all long form. I've done long form interviews with Bobby Rydell, uh, Lucy, Lucy, Lucy Arnez, Judy Gold, Lisa Lampanelli, Bob Costas. Who's somebody else, Jane? Quick, give me a name, give me a name. Um, and more. And finally, what's not so good? If you have to pick one thing that you don't like about talk today, it's what? Inauthenticity. Lack of real conversations. But it, this is authentic. You, you and I are talking. So talk today is well, a lot more talk today than the, there's a lot more talk today than there was a, a year ago because of the pandemic. And even stars who are at home seem to be having more real conversations than hyped up stuff. One of the things that, that I get to in the book is I can't send the overarching hyped up, hey, ah, audiences like this, guests like this, um, 
people are just talking like real human beings now. And uh, well, like that. we got to do this again. I don't know when, but sometime soon. You know, I, I, I always said I got to meet Bill Boggs and say hello. I knew, you know, some of the people as I said, they come down to Washington. Always said the great. Some of your producers and okay. uh, they, they name names. Oh, her. Oh, him. And um, it's just a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, the Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog, as told to Bill Boggs. There we go. Or two. Or now, two. Please go to animal rescue organizations. I forgot to say Tom Dreesen and Tom, and, and Tom Cotter. They've also been on my most recent show. So have a good well, time. You know what? I, uh, ho I hope it goes to continued success, A, with the book, B, with you. Look forward to talk with you again. Um, stay safe down in South Florida and Palm Beach. Uh, and uh, really a pleasure. Thank you so much. Pillbox. Your guard up at all times. Thanks, Ross.